from the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. Maria Incher Orang is the CEO of Simplifiber, a company making lab-grown biodegradable materials for the apparel industry. We've created a way to turn plant fibers into 3D shoes, clothing, and accessories without the need for yarn or fabric or cutting and sewing. So really, it's the future of fashion. Simplifiber has been operating for a couple of years. It has a dozen employees. And last summer, Maria and her co-founder raised a $3.5 million seed round. Since we're an early stage company, our money comes from the funding that we received in our seed and pre-seed. Uh, And we draw from that to pay our employees and pay all of our expenses and costs. And as Maria told our producer Daniel, when the company raised that money, it turned to the bank of choice for many startups. So all of your money is in Silicon Valley Bank? Yes, 100% of our cash uh, up until very recently was with Silicon Valley Bank. The sudden collapse of California's Silicon Valley Bank has thrown sand into the gears of the tech industry. Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB, was a mid-sized bank that catered to entrepreneurs and wealthy individuals, largely in the tech sector. It supported 50% of U.S. startups in tech and life sciences, and the bank was an early believer and investor in the clean tech and climate tech space, courting companies like Simplifiber. But things quickly unraveled this month. On Wednesday, March 8th, SVB executives told investors they'd sold off a massive portfolio of mortgage bonds and needed to sell stock to raise cash fast. The bank took a loss of $1.8 billion on the sale of bonds, fueled in part by the Federal Reserve's rapid interest rate increases. And that freaked people out. The next day, Thursday, the bank was downgraded, the stock price took a nosedive, and high-profile investors started telling their companies to take their cash out of the bank. As fear set in, customers rushed to withdraw $42 billion in deposits. Maria and her team are based in North Carolina, so the panic that gripped Silicon Valley investors on Thursday hadn't consumed her yet. But she noticed something was off when doing some routine banking. My co-founder couldn't go on the website. He was having trouble. And then he asked me to try it. I, When I checked the website for SBB, it just said website unavailable. We kind of didn't think anything too much about it. We thought maybe there's website maintenance going on. And, uh, and when I went home that night, I, I read on Instagram that, you know, there might be a run on the bank happening. By the time the Simplifiber team understood how severe the problem was for SVB, it was too late. SVB couldn't keep up with the tens of billions of dollars in withdrawals. But then towards the afternoon and the end of the day, we realized this is looking really bad. And so by that time, we thought, okay, can we, can we get access to our money? Can we move our money? And we weren't able to do that. All of Simplifiber's funds were locked in a bank that was on the verge of collapse. And then it looked like the worst case scenario was going to play out. By Friday morning, the bank had failed. We were actually most worried about making payroll and our employees and how long we'd be able to um, keep them going. And we were worried, of course, about the survival of the company. I mean, outwardly, I'm a very calm person. Uh, I'm not a panicker, neither is my co-founder. Um, but inwardly, well, we were both not sleeping, and when we slept, it was like nightmares. What were those nightmares about? Banking. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was about like it was very end of the world scenarios, very end of the company scenarios, and tension dreams. SVB wasn't just a bank for startups. It was a leading bank and lender for climate tech startups too, and its implosion will leave an indelible mark on the industry. It's not just, you know, tech bros doing crypto (laughs) and things like that or making games. This is actually like physical work that we need to have happen. Yeah, this isn't software. It'll require probably the better part of half a billion dollars of investment to get there. It would have been a real stumble out of the blocks to take this first small seed investment and have it vaporize. So they were early pioneers in clean tech, what became known as climate tech. They were here from the beginning. Filling that hole, that's going to be something that I think uh, we're going to be missing them for a long time. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. This week, the demise of SVB. We just narrowly avoided complete financial meltdown for climate tech. What was the bank's role in the industry and what happens with it gone?
The Carbon Copy is supported by Scale Microgrids, the distributed energy company dedicated to transforming the way modern energy infrastructure is designed, constructed, and financed. Backed by Warburg Pincus, Scale sets up their customers for success by creating more certainty and simplicity from start to finish. They are technology agnostic, with the mission of finding the most effective and optimized infrastructure for each project's specific needs. Distributed generation can be complex. Scale Microgrids makes it easy. Visit scalemicrogrids.com to learn more. The Carbon Copy is supported by Fish Tank PR, a public relations, strategic messaging, thought leadership, and social media agency dedicated to elevating the work of early stage and established companies that are taking on some of the most pressing climate and energy challenges of our time. From making sure your next announcement is heard to helping find relevant industry events to tell your story, Fish Tank PR is here to help you. To learn more about Fish Tank's approach to clean tech and their services, visit fishtankpr.com. That's F I S C H P R.com. We'll link to it in the show notes. SVB's collapse was the biggest bank failure since the 2008 financial crisis. It was the first true online bank run in history, which is what made the crisis play out so quickly. The wildest thing about this whole debacle is that if you were a founder with cash at SVB, you could have gone on an extended weekend wilderness trip without internet, unknowingly had your company's cash wiped out on Friday, and then return on Tuesday with it all back. Your biggest headache may be finding a new bank. And that's because the federal government did, of course, step in to take over SVB to stop a contagion. And founders like Maria got a guarantee that their money would be safe. By Monday, Simple Fiber had a new bank account and a fresh wire of cash. That was amazing. I let out a yelp of joy when that happened. What did your co-founder say? Oh, I mean, he just showed me a picture of the account, and we we were texting at that point, but um, we were like screaming, <laughs> and we called. Yeah, we called each other. <laughs> we were very happy. So we are not going to go deep on every factor that caused this crisis. When something like this happens, it's often a cascading series of failures, and we're still trying to understand exactly what happened inside the bank. But I'll summarize the plot quickly. Silicon Valley Bank had a unique set of customers, again, primarily startups and wealthy individuals, who had way more than the $250,000 limit for federal deposit insurance. In fact, 97% of customers were over that limit, making them the kind of customers who would likely pull their money out of the bank if something bad happened. But during the pandemic, when the tech industry was booming, interest rates were at zero, and the venture capital was flowing, a lot of new customers parked their cash with SVB. That included a lot of climate tech startups. Deposits at SVB doubled in 2021. Like all banks, SVB needed to invest some of that money, so it bought a large portfolio of mortgage bonds, thinking they would earn solid returns in a low interest rate environment. But the Fed kept raising interest rates to get inflation under control until that massive portfolio was a money loser. And when wealthy clients, influential people with large social media followings who are also on group chats with other influential people started worrying about the solvency of the bank, it caused a panic. SVB lost $42 billion in a day. But not everyone pulled their money out right away. How have the last, like, four days gone for you? <laughs> well, uh, the last uh, day or day and a half has been far more relaxing than the prior three or four, I would say. That's Gabriel Craw, managing director and co-founder of Prelude Ventures. Since 2013, they've invested in 60 climate tech companies. Many of those companies, and Prelude itself, had a close banking relationship with SVB. The day before the bank failed, Gabriel was on a conference call with then-CEO Greg Becker. The bank was getting scrutinized for its bad mortgage portfolio, and SVB had alarmed investors and depositors by taking a sudden $2 billion loss on the sale of that portfolio. Becker was trying to calm everyone down. And then Greg said something peculiar on the call. He said, we're solvent, we're in great shape, uh, and the only thing that can bring us down is if all of you tell all of your companies to start pulling out share money. And I think at that point in time, a lot of people on that call said, oh my God, should we start telling all of our companies to start pulling out all their money? And I think that's when things got really uh, seriously bad for Silicon Valley Bank. So full disclosure, Prelude is an investor in PostScript Media. That's the company I co-founded that makes this show. 
PostScript did not have any direct exposure to SVB, but lots of companies in Prelude's portfolio, these are companies that are building factories and fleets and products, spent a couple of days in financial limbo. For many companies, they actually had to make payroll uh, on Monday or Tuesday. And $250,000 was not enough to make payroll. So we quickly figured out who amongst uh, our portfolio was at risk of not making payroll. Because if you can't make payroll, you can't have employees come to work. And that's kind of a shutdown situation for a company. So we, we figured out that we could call capital into our fund. We could get it out to our uh, companies at a low cost to them way. Uh, and then we spent the rest of the weekend working with the companies and with our counsel and with our CFO to get the legal structure in place, and then also working to figure out who needed how much and, and how soon. That was what we were doing from, you know, kind of noon one on Friday through Sunday afternoon. And then what happened Sunday? <laughs> well, Sunday afternoon, um, we got the news that the Federal Reserve and the FDIC acting together, also with the president's authority, were going to guarantee uh, all the deposits uh, and all the depositors. In, in a nutshell, that's what they did. And I think that was a really good move um, by those agencies, by those actors. I want to take a step back and talk about who Silicon Valley Bank is and its role in the climate tech community. So give me a sense for this bank's role in the venture community first, and then we'll talk about the, the climate tech community. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking about this. And Silicon Valley Bank was for many companies, many entrepreneurs, small businesses, venture-backed companies, they were the lender of first resort. They were a team uh, of professionals who knew the industries they covered. They knew the players they covered. They knew uh, the dynamics of the industry. And so whatever vertical you're talking about, they were able to come in and make very informed, risk-based decisions. And they also had wonderful relationships with the investor community uh, and with the entrepreneurs and the CEOs and the CFOs and, and the, uh, the, the startup community. So what that meant was that if a company raised you know, $10 million in equity, they could also then go to Silicon Valley Bank and raise, you know, a couple of million dollars more in debt, which gives, made them better capitalized. I'm not going to go into a lecture of why debt versus equity is more advantageous, uh, in certain ways to the entrepreneur. You know, it's not dilutive, but SVB, uh, went beyond that. They offered equipment lines. So when you need to, when you're buying equipment, you can borrow money that is secured specifically against that piece of equipment. That's great because it saves your precious equity dollars for other activities, building and growing the company. They offered account receivable, AR lines, so that if you had revenue and customers coming in, uh, you could borrow against those numbers, and that was a great uh, supply of working capital for the company. Uh, they would also do the same things. Not, I'm not as intimately familiar with it because that's not where we are super active on the project side, doing all sorts of lending for various uh, projects. This is getting now more into the climate tech sector. Um, so that's sort of, I just was describing what they did for the tech industry generally. And for climate tech, they did the same thing. But what it means is that if you have a company that has a three or five year time horizon to developing a product that produces, uh, that you can sell for a att attractive gross margin uh, so that the company can eventually be profitable, uh, that takes time and that takes a lot of equity dollars and that takes a lot of capital. And Silicon Valley Bank was able and willing to go in at the earliest stages and work with and support those companies. Um, and they did that with industry knowledge and with strong relationships up and down the community. That's a function that enabled, that empowered Silicon Valley, that helped make Silicon Valley better at starting really amazing companies. And in climate tech, they were the leading lending partner out there, period. And how unique is that? There are a lot of banks in this country. Why is that different from the way a lot of other banks operate? Short answer, other banks are more 
risk averse on the traditional financial metrics that you do to to measure the quality of a loan. Um, but Silicon Valley Bank, understanding the startup ecosystem, understanding how these companies grew from a series seed or series A to profitability in the long run, having been there for years and years around the ecosystem, had expertise that allowed them to lend to companies uh, on all of these different lending instruments in ways that traditional banks or other banks weren't able to do. Many companies would graduate from Silicon Valley Bank to other larger or more traditional Wall Street banks. Um, They would keep the relationship with SVB. They would continue to uh, borrow and work with SVB, but then they would layer on other uh, debt providers uh, afterwards. But the first lender, the lender who was willing to go in and lend money when it was the most important to the company, uh, was SVB. We are going to take a very brief pause here. And after we come back, we'll ask, how bad will this be long term for climate tech? The Carbon Copy is brought to you by Scale Microgrids. Did you know Scale Microgrids does a lot more than build industry-leading microgrids? Well, they do. Combined with technical expertise, Scale finances and acquires distributed energy projects of all sizes. At Scale, the engineers, designers, lawyers, accountants, and project finance experts all work under the same roof, which cuts out external intermediaries that add complexity, risk, and costs for developers and customers. Whether you're building microgrids, EV infrastructure, community solar, combined heat and power, or battery storage, set your project up for success with scale. They create more certainty, simplicity, and cost savings in your electrification process. Go to scalemicrogrids.com to learn more. The Carbon Copy is supported by Fish Tank PR, a public relations, strategic messaging, thought leadership, and social media agency dedicated to elevating the work of early stage and established companies that are solving some of the most pressing climate and energy challenges of our time. Fish Tank's approach to working with clients is focused on leveraging deep industry and media expertise and relationships to craft compelling narratives that resonate with journalists as well as investors, customers, and talent recruitment. You can think of Fish Tank as an extension of your own team, from making sure your news is heard to helping find events where you can tell your story. Fish Tank PR is here to help you. They help translate complex ideas and technologies into tangible, compelling content that resonates with your target audiences, so you can stay focused on bringing technology at scale to market. To learn more about Fish Tank's approach to clean tech and their services, visit fishtankpr.com. That's F-I-S-C-H tankpr.com, and you can find the link in the show notes. If you like the way we cover business and tech trends here on The Carbon Copy, I've got another podcast that you should check out. It's called Climate Rising from Harvard Business School. Climate Rising gives you behind-the-scenes views into how some of the world's best and brightest business leaders are confronting climate change. Each episode, Harvard Business School professor Mike Toffel dives into the challenges and opportunities that climate change presents to innovators and businesses. If you're new to Climate Rising, check out their recent episode about McKinsey's Climate Consulting. Mike interviews the global co-leader of McKinsey's Sustainability. It's a conversation about how they've helped address climate risk and opportunity for clients, sustainable investing, and of course, decarbonization. So don't miss it. It's Climate Rising, and you can find it on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So Brian, tell me who you are. I'm Brian Guido Hassan. I'm the CEO of Dexmat, a climate tech moonshot company displacing steel, aluminum, and copper with advanced carbon negative materials. I just saw some my, of my lights flicker for a moment. We've got some super heavy snow. So if this call cuts out, it's probably because the power cut out. It wouldn't be the first time that something completely failed on me in the, uh, in the last few days. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some criticism on social media about the federal government stepping in to save a bank that caters to Silicon Valley elites. And look, I get the reaction, but as Gabriel explained, SVB was a big backer of companies in life sciences and climate tech. It provided loans, project finance, and banking services to over 1,500 climate tech companies. And that included companies like Dexmat, which are building real, physical, potentially transformative things. Our aspiration is is nothing short of displacing steel and aluminum and copper. You know, this isn't software. It'll require probably the better part of half a billion dollars of investment to get there. And um, it would have been a real stumble out of the blocks to take this first small seed investment and, uh, and have it vaporize. 
The week of SVB's downfall was supposed to be Dexmat's big coming out party. The company had just closed a $3 million seed round with Shell Ventures as a lead investor. Brian was unveiling Dexmat at Sarah Week, this giant conference of global energy executives in Houston. And on Thursday, he got on stage and pitched his vision. And then our presentation went really well. So people and organizations were coming up to us afterward and kind of inundating us with interest. And finally, it was late Thursday night that I was kind of sitting back, finally having a chance to you know, take my phone out of airplane mode and, and catch up with what's going on. And I thought it was going to be a moment of patting myself on the back and saying, all right, you know, we've hit this milestone. Everything's great. And instead, as I'm starting to catch up in the hashtag energy Twitter and maybe more broadly, just the Twitterverse, you know, my eyes are getting bigger and bigger and thinking, oh my gosh, we might have a big problem here. Um, I'm not sure if you are a Star Wars fan, but there's a scene in Return of the Jedi where they attack the uh, Death Star, they think that the shields are down and then all of a sudden they start to realize the shields are up and then it says, well, this is going to be the shortest offensive in history, or something to that effect and that's how I was starting, I was having this creeping sensation, oh my gosh, we spent the last two days like launching our company and setting this big, bold, ambitious moonshot and you know, tomorrow I'm going to have to announce that we're out of money it's going to be the shortest um, kind of climate tech company in history In a worst case scenario, what would have happened to you? The email I sent out to all of our investors on Saturday basically laid out that we had enough cash reserves as was to fund about two months of operations. The worst case scenario would have just been that you know, we basically had to re-raise a round. And the, the good news here is that investors had just invested in us. Many of the investors have you know, pretty deep pockets. I say Shell Ventures led the round. I mean, it's challenging for us and our existing shareholders because that would cause a lot of dilution. And also, you know, when we think about the the chain of events here, if all of our money had dried up, it's likely that some of our investors' money would have dried up. So some of them may not have been able to offer that sort of lifeline or or reinvest. Again, the the big um, corporate strategic investors probably would have been a little more impervious to it. But we were we were definitely thinking through that scenario. Again, it's we're our focus is on two to three gigatons of annual CO2 impact. And if that means we have to give up a significant additional portion of the company to do it, so be it. Suboptimal, but so be it. Nothing like a little financial crisis to kick up the nerves as you look to reinvent the materials industry. <laughs> you know, all we're trying to do is, you know, push uh, an industrial revolution scale innovation of, of materials. So uh, I guess that's too easy. We might as well have a financial crisis to uh, make things a little more interesting. So even with the last minute save of SVB deposits, there are a lot of unknowns about what happens next. Other banks have teetered. The FDIC says U.S. banks have $620 billion in unrealized losses sitting on their books, thanks to investments that lost value and interest rates rose. But the absolute worst case scenario, the virtual wipeout of hundreds of climate tech companies, didn't come to pass. So I asked Gabriel of Prelude Ventures, what next for the sector? So in the short term, we have averted a complete catastrophe, but... There's a lot of questions about what parts of the business will be sold off, what happens to the lending business, uh, you know, what kind of waves does this make at other banks? Will it be harder for startups to raise money generally? Like, what, There are a lot of ripple effects here that people are just trying to grapple with now. What do you think those are? Companies have just lost a really great source of funding for them. If you raise... $10 million in equity, and you suddenly, instead of being able to raise 4 or $5 million of various forms of debt to supplement it as you're building your company for the next 18 months, you can only raise 2 or $3 million, that's going to slow down company growth. If you raise those 2 or $3 million on worse terms, that's going to slow down growth. Or if you raise that money on terms... Uh, that you're a little bit nervous about the counterparty of, you know, meaning who is the on the other side of that loan? How are they going to behave when things get tough? If things get tough, you might think more closely about taking on that debt. All of those things slow innovation. It's not going to stop innovation. It's not going to stop climate tech, but it's going to slow it down. It's going to provide more friction. Silicon Valley Bank, I would often say to CEOs and boards, okay, they came in a little bit higher uh, in their cost of capital or a little bit more in the warrant coverage that they required or some you know, detail of the loan, right? But 
we know that if we need an extension on that loan, we know that if there's some covenant trigger that is significant but not life-threatening and does not damage the prospects of the company to repay that loan, the people at Silicon Valley Bank, the people we work with, are going to go to bat for us. So having that partnership, having that uh, ability to rely on them to being really good actors is is something that another firm is going to have to build up that well of trust. That's what we've lost. Who do you think is responsible for this mess? I mean, <laughs> you have uh, the, the, the fastest bank run in history. You have, you know, a lot of really legitimate concern about uh, these investments in mortgage bonds and um, questions to leadership about whether they should have known better. And so, you you know, a lot of people are trying to figure out, like, who's responsible here? Any thoughts on, like, what precipitated this historic run on the bank? And, it, it, you know, wh- where you think responsibility lies? Uh, I think responsibility lies in a, several different places, honestly. I think, frankly, uh, the bank is at fault. And it's not the folks who I was just talking about. It's not the, the, the frontline people who were doing uh, the work with the companies, uh, they made money. This is not a problem with the business model I was just talking about. They did really well. Um, the, The bank did really well financially issuing and making those loans. But I'm an investor in a financial services company that, that issues loans to, uh, you know, that issues essentially what, what are more or less residential loans. And so we have a warehouse facility and we originate loans into that warehouse over a period of months and accumulate loans into that warehouse. We always hedged that warehouse. Every, we not only hedged the warehouse to the extent that we were able to, we hedge um, the loans that are authorized but not yet issued. And that was always an expense of doing business and we always looked at it and monitored it at every board meeting. And uh, we never thought about taking off that hedge. And then it was an expense until in this rising interest rate environment, we continued to make money on those loans because of the hedge, right? So a hedge is an expense until it saves your ass. They didn't do that. I don't know how you invest in these, you know, the government collateralized mortgage-backed securities, that's like the $90 billion of hold-to-maturity assets, and the other available for sale assets, the $20 billion that they sold at the $1.8 billion loss. I don't know how you buy all of those assets, which are clearly hedgeable, without doing that. That was a falling down. A friend of mine literally said this morning, on a list of things you're going to hedge, mortgage-backed securities have got to be near the top. That was a huge failure of risk management and control. On the other hand, I'm not going to name names. I've heard people kind of smugly saying, we were the first ones to tell our companies to get out, and we had no downside to doing it, and only upside. It's my job to prevent risk for my companies. And My answer to that is, well, did you really prevent risk, or did you actually create a risk for your companies? And you might have just destroyed an institution that created value for our companies. And turns out that the people who tried to stay the course are in just as good shape as you are, except the whole ecosystem took a body blow that it didn't need to take. So I think there's some blame to be pointed there towards the people who were kind of the ringleaders in let's get out at all costs, you know, rats fleeing a ship. I don't know if that's the right metaphor, but we didn't do that. We didn't tell our companies to do that. And we're in just as good shape uh, as those other folks are on Tuesday morning. So where are we? If we take into account future impacts to the industry, uh, but also averting this potential catastrophe, where are we on the spectrum of apocalyptic to, uh, eh, this isn't so bad? Well, right now we're at, this isn't so bad. And and the reason we are is because uh the Fed and the FDIC uh, working with President Biden, they did a pretty good job, honestly, right? Like, this is not going to cost taxpayer money. The the funds are going to be 
paid for by the FDIC reserve. Probably there's going to be very little drawn from that from Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, they, they, they set up a, uh, a lending facility uh, out, of the, you know, out of the Fed of really low cost debt so that banks can borrow from that very cheaply to, to give depositors their accounts back if there should be pressure. Uh, they also reduce the collateral uh, required to borrow from the Fed. Those two things not only make it easier for banks to give depositors money if there's a lot of withdrawals, but it actually then assures folks that those banks will have money to meet their withdrawals. I think that was a really strong, robust uh, set of actions that they took on Sunday afternoon. The, the tough part is losing an institution that helped really drive the innovation economy forward uh, and losing an institution that was a key part of early stage climate tech innovation and that helped enable it. <laughs> Gabriel Craw, thanks so much. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Stephen. I appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. That is going to do it for the show. You also heard from Maria incher Orang of Simplifiber and Brian guido Hostin of Dexmat. This episode was produced by me with support from Dalvin Abouage and Daniel Waldorf. Sean Marquand is our engineer. Original music came from Echo Finch and Blue Dot Sessions. Can you help us out? If this is a uh, valuable resource for you, you know, we're trying to tell good stories and provide really solid resources for people figuring out the business of climate solutions. Give us a rating and review or pass a link to someone who you think would like the show. It's definitely helpful. And as we disclosed before, Postscript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures, and Prelude invests in climate entrepreneurs across advanced energy, food, ag, transportation, advanced materials, logistics, manufacturing, advanced computing. And uh, thanks for listening, and good luck to all the startups out there who are listening to this show dealing with the fallout of this crisis. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. 